Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The parable of the Good Samaritan. It's not even really described as a parable. He just, Jesus sort of gives the account. Maybe it's a true story. Maybe it's a story that they had heard many other times as well. Who knows? But the simple question asked by that lawyer sums up the many questions asked by well-meaning Christians, well-meaning members of society, those who wish to do well in this world and the world hereafter. They can all be summed up in that seemingly innocuous question of the lawyer. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And in a way, as a pastor, I've heard this question often. I've even asked the question myself. Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Must I suffer all these things? Must I endure all these things? Who do I have to think of? What do I have to be about? Do I have to come to church? Do I have to receive communion? Do I have to be baptized? What about my giving? Do I have to be very charitable? So I do all these things and get to heaven, right? Well, no. We do all these things and we still call ourselves a beggar. Poor, miserable sinners. Dead in our trespasses and sins. But that doesn't follow the course of logic. I do all that you ask of me. Shouldn't that be enough? But no. Now, I don't know that there are any lawyers among us today, but lawyers being as lawyers are, he follows up with a question to Jesus. Jesus had answered him, yes, you've answered wisely. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your body, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, that is the right answer. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer wanting to justify himself wants to play a game with the language. He wants to get it down to the bare minimums. He wants to, to cut it left from right and so that he knows exactly what he has to do to get eternal life so that he doesn't do any extra. So teacher, who's my neighbor? What do you mean by neighbor? Define neighbor for me so that I make sure I get this right. Maybe it's a loophole. See, it's about his motivation. It's about his heart. Really, the lawyer's question, and even Jesus' response in the parable of the Good Samaritan, it's about his faith. It's about the one who has compassion. It's about the one who shows mercy to a neighbor. Look again at the lawyer's question. And his answer to Jesus, his motivation. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He's testing Jesus. It's the same word that was used to describe how Satan treated Jesus in the wilderness. Testing him. Trying to trip him up. He thought he already knew the answer. He doesn't need a teacher to tell him anything. He knew the law. He was a lawyer. He knew what was required of him, or what he had settled on a long time ago, what he thought applied to him. And he wanted to prove himself right and wise and good and faithful, lawful. He wanted to justify himself. But it's a trap. Satan had set a trap for this lawyer. Satan was lying in wait. And in the journey of this man's life, he, would, he was set upon by Satan who would try to rob him of the faith of which he was a lawyer, of which he was a teacher. Blinded by sin, this lawyer never saw it coming. His pride, his selfishness, his self-righteousness, his desire to justify himself lie at the lawyer's question. And so these sins, they beat him down, and they leave him for dead. 
You see, the question was about minimums and limits. The question was about himself, not about his neighbor. His question was about the law. He goes to the one who is the gospel. And he asks about the law. The Torah, the very word of God in flesh, is not about the law, but about fulfilling it in our place. To ask about the gospel, to inherit eternal life, is to ask about freedom and abundance, not about limits and how much. And this is what Jesus teaches us today and teaches us about our neighbor. You see, this lawyer answers the question, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor. That's the two tables of the law, really. As you look here in our stained glass, we have the, the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments on, the, on your right-hand side here. And there's commandments 1, 2, and 3, and then 4 through 10. I've talked about this before. The first table of the law relates us to God. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And that second table of the law has to do with our neighbor. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. My kids can do that, too. <laughs> Every morning they ask me. Tell me, ask me the Ten Commandments. They know them. You see, love God and love your neighbor. Do this and you will live. It's not that easy, is it? Even the neighbors who we like, we have trouble doing good to all the time and loving them as much as we love ourselves, let alone the late neighbors that we, that we don't like. Maybe they've got the crazy dog or the, the, the crazy car that's out front and we can't get rid of. Maybe you don't like this or that about the color of their house or their roof or maybe the way that they work in the cubicle next to you. Whatever it is. Who is my neighbor? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life, this lawyer asks. He only loved his neighbor as much as the neighbor could do something for him. How much do I have to do to slip by? The only love that he had for his neighbor was what loving his neighbor could do for him. Sure, I'll love my neighbor if that's what I have to do to have eternal life. Neighbor, come here. Let me love you. I want to have eternal life. But that's not love. That's selfishness. To love one's neighbor to satisfy the law it's just throwing yourself into that ditch. And we, we, we're careful. We have to be cautious about this motivation, friends in Christ, as we go forth with the gospel. That we don't look at our neighbors and our friends and our, those who live around us, those who need the gospel and who are hurting, we don't look at them as opportunities to say, here's how I can inherit eternal life. Here's how I can score one for my team. Here's how I can put another butt in the pew and another dollar in the plate so that maybe we can go another day, another year, or something else. That's not what our neighbors are for. That would be selfish. And so you see, when we can see ourselves in light of the Ten Commandments, of God's call to love our neighbor and to love him above all things, we find ourselves not living in the way that we should go, but we find that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We find ourselves not asking the question, who is my neighbor, so that we would know who to be good to. No, we find ourselves asking the question, who is my neighbor? Because I am in a ditch. Here I am, beset upon by my sins, and beaten down by my own sinful nature. I'm not half dead. I'm not mostly dead. I'm all dead in my sins and trespasses. Dead, beaten, and bloodied. Because we've been selfish, we've been lusty, we've been covetous, we've been gossipous. 
We have not let God's love have its way with us. And so our worship and prayers have faltered. We've been set upon by the thieves of sin, death, the devil, and our own sinful nature who would try to steal our faith and rob us of life everlasting. So we cry out now, who is my neighbor? Not for my benefit that I can find my way to eternal life, but I ask, who is my neighbor? Not that I might do good and win the way out of the ditch, but who is my neighbor that will have compassion on me? Who is my neighbor who will bind up my wounds, pour in the soothing oil and wine, and carry me to safety? Who is my neighbor that can rescue me from this body of death? Christ Jesus it is. He is the good shepherd and the good neighbor and the good Samaritan. Our true and holy neighbor who has traveled our path of life before us comes upon us. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. He spares no expense to rescue us. He comes to the place where we are, like this Samaritan, and goes to us, stoops down into our depression, into our dementia, into our grief, into our sorrow, and he gives us the gospel which says, you have eternal life. Not what must I do to inherit eternal life, but in the cross and in the resurrection and in the blood of Jesus, you have eternal life. This day, as you wrestle with your sins and with your demons, God's word and sacraments are given for you, for the forgiveness of your sins and the strengthening of your faith. And just as the body of this traveler was granted strength and recovery by the grace of the Samaritan, so to your soul, though bearing the marks of trial and struggle, is granted strength and newness of life through the precious gifts of God. Christ comes to where we are and puts us in his place, and he takes ours. His unction grace is poured out to you today. As you hear his word, it is freely proclaimed, and it is eternally true and set. Nothing grants healing and strength to the soul like hearing the good news that your sins are forgiven. Your sorrows will be healed. Christ is yours. The free grace of God is proclaimed to you. Dear neighbors in Christ, when we hear the parable of the Good Samaritan, when we remember to love our neighbor as ourselves, that is to pass on what we have already received from Christ. In faith, we remember that the parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. And so we have here a picture of the kingdom of God, the salvation which he has won for us. And as we know that now we are that traveler in need, we know that he is our good Samaritan and heals our wounds and our sorrows and our griefs. We are the traveler, and he is the healer. So he picks us up, binds our wounds, and brings us to the inn of the one holy Christian and apostolic church, to the house of his very father. And he tells his servants who are here to care for you, body and soul, he says, take care of them until I return one day, because we know he will come back. And he's left all that we need to provide for you. The two denarii of word and sacrament. All that we need. He will bring a rich reward of heaven when he returns, just as he has promised. This lawyer wanted to try to justify himself. But it is God alone who justifies. It is Christ who sets him free. Instead of justifying himself, instead he meets his loving neighbor who finds him helpless, the loving neighbor of Christ who has compassion for you, for all. He proclaimed God's word to this lawyer, both law and gospel. 
so that he might inherit eternal life. This day and every day as we sojourn through this journey of life from our Jerusalem to Jericho, the good neighbor Jesus himself gives us nothing less than everything than himself. He lifts us up out of the ditch, binds our wounds and heals us, nourishes our faith in word and sacrament, and gives us eternal life, the forgiveness of all our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace which surpasses all human understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.